Uh, down at the bottom of your screen, you have a little toggle that you can bring up a chat window. So if you want to ask questions, Clint is furiously typing away and, and writing down excess questions that people are asking. So at the end of our, our little chat here, um, we can answer those questions, as many as we can. Um, at the, the end of this, once this gets posted up on YouTube as well, I will have a link down here for our Discord group. So if you forgot a question or didn't get your question answered while we're chatting, or you think of one after we're done, you can have your parents help you uh, ask questions on Discord, which is just a, a nice little, little chat function. So you can type questions to us. So we're trying to, we're trying to get as many avenues as possible for people to ask questions and get their science fix. Uh, on the, the chat, if you want to, uh, we'd just like to hear where people are from. So are you, are you from North Dakota or are you, are you from out of state? Do you want to learn about a different state? We are the North Dakota Geological Survey. So that means most of our chats are going to be fairly centered around North Dakota's prehistory, just because that's what we're studying and that's what we're working with. So if you, if you want to chat, you know, where are you from, what you're interested in, we can try and tailor some of the the future talks to things that you are interested in as well. We are getting a list going and the list is up on Discord and we'll get a, a future list up on Facebook and Twitter as well. We're getting events listed for which topics are gonna be on which days. Make sure to stick around next week. We're kicking it off. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Clint. <laughs> We're kicking it off next week, Monday, with saber-toothed cats. So you'll get to stare at, at Clint's face instead of my face. Mix things up a little bit. Welcome to Chatting with NDGS Paleo. My name is Becky Barnes, and I'm a paleontologist and lab manager here with the North Dakota Geological Survey. We work in the basement of the Heritage Center in the Johns Rood Paleontology Laboratory. It sounds really cool if you say laboratory that way mixing things up. <laughs> uh, and we're, we're just trying to get some extra science out there. Today's topic, we are working with uh, one of the very first fossils that, that I received as a, as a child was ammonites. Ammonites, kind of fun stuff. And where'd my baby go? Oh, ah. Okay. I have a whole desk full of stuff here. Sorry, I have to reach over and grab random items. So when I was little and I got bitten by the dinosaur bug, I got a chronic case of dinosauritis when I was about five, six years old. I decided that fossils were amazing and dinosaurs were amazing and my parents were kind of like, mm, sure, we'll, we'll humor you. And, and they got me some books here and there, but, uh, but I, th th there wasn't a whole lot out there for encouragement. My uncle, however, decided that he was going to help try and fuel the paleo bug. And so the very first fossil that I got was an ammonite. Now, I have no idea what kind of ammonite this is. Um, I've had this for going on about 32 years now. So this was my very first fossil. And you can see it's very shiny. It's very smooth. I'll show it in the cross section here. It's been sliced in half. So this is the inside of our ammonite shell on this. And some of it's kind of faded. It's filled in with sediment. It's, it's kind of hard to see. But you can see some of the little living chambers on the inside of this spiral. Now, one of the things that makes an ammonite an ammonite is how they make their shells. Now, ammonites are related to other creatures that are still alive today. And if you've ever been to a oh, like an aquarium, you've gone to, to different cities and you've seen like the Shed Aquarium or the Hawaii Aquarium or wherever you're at, you're, you're, you're at, usually they have one little isolated tank off to the side, kind of forgotten about, that houses a nautilus, a chambered nautilus, which at first kind of looks like an ammonite because it's got a shell, it's got this hard shell around the outside, but they're, they're really, really distant relatives. Ammonites are actually more closely related to another kind of creature. Da, da, da. Octopus and squid meet Inkbert. This is Inkbert. The octopus doesn't have a name. So the difference between an octopus and a squid, an octopus has, based on the name, eight arms. 
And a squid has eight arms and two longer uh, tentacles for feeding. So they actually have 10 arms. Now, all tentacles are arms and not all arms are tentacles. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> getting, getting a thumbs up. So these things don't have an external shell. They're all soft and, and, and squishy. But squid especially have an internal shell. They're, they're hard, they have a, a hard rod running through the, the body portion of this animal. And it's called a pen bone or a gladius. And it looks kind of like an arrow. If you've ever had to prepare calamari, uh, you can get frozen squid in the grocery store. And you just like, it's really funny. It's like a cube, it's a squid brick. It's kind of depressing really. <laughs> but you can, you can get a squid brick, thaw them out. And part of your preparation for dealing with cooking squid is removing that pen bone. And so that's on the inside. The, the, the ones that we get at the grocery store are really super thin, maybe about as thin as our fingernails. So they're really, really fine, but it is still a rigid structure. Ammonites have their rigid structure on the outside of the animal instead of the inside of the animal. And how they grow is they, you know, they start off little teeny tiny and they add on to their shell over and over and over again as they grow bigger and bigger. And here we go. Here we go. Here's a, this, this particular shell is from Madagascar. I'll stop it here. So this, this one is from Madagascar and, or Morocco. Ah, oh, now I don't remember. But I've also had this one forever, <laughs> three weeks, and you would have the tentacles coming out down here. And you can see in the middle here, if I can get my camera to focus. Come on camera, you can do it. I hold really still, there we go. It's gonna start here in the middle and the animal grows bigger and bigger and bigger, adding onto its shell until it finally gets to the end. And the animal is only living in that last little chamber. It does not live in the rest of this shell. So this, this shell is called, called a uh, phragmacone. And ammonites, most ammonites, grow their shells in something that's called a planispiral. Now planispiral means that it's flat. It's all in one plane. All, everything is tucked in. The, the smaller shell is, is tucked inside the larger shell and it's all within one line, one horizontal plane. But that's not all ammonites. Some of them are really wonky and have a shell that's called a heteromorph. And I have a little tiny, it's a little teeny tiny, but it's really cool. This is a little heteromorph shell. And you can see it looks a little bit more like a snail shell where it's just kind of all over the place. It's got this whole big spiral coming up off the side here, Whoa, all over the place. So they're a little bit more wonky. Now ammonites and their relatives have been around for a long time, long, long time, since at least the Devonian. And they started off, or at least their, their relatives started off with straight shells, similar to, like I said, lots of stuff off the side, similar to this little creature. This is called Orthoceros. These are fairly common. You can find them in fossil and rock shops all over the place. If I can convince my camera to focus, come on camera just does not like me. Anyways, you can kind of see how it's, it's very long. It's very straight. This is a straight shelled animal. And you can still see how the spaces or the lines in between each of these living chambers is very smooth. So this is a very, very old, old animal, like 400 million years old, super old. And it has a very smooth septa. These little lines in between here are called septa. And they've actually found other kinds of creatures like Belemnatella. Got him hiding behind me. Belemnatella. This is another, another squid. This, this particular one has the shell on the inside again, not on the outside. So this is uh, the rod that's on the, on the inside of the animal. And in the middle here, they would also contain ink sacs. And they used to, uh, people that used to discover these would find these old ink sacks and they would grind them up and use them for ink. Kind of neat. So there are actually some, some old um, manuscripts and, and papers that are using these old, old, old 
ink sacs for a writing medium. All right. Uh, let's see. So yes, the, the Ammonites have been around for a very, very long time. And they've changed throughout time. They've gotten more, or they, they've become more complex the closer to the age of dinosaurs that, that they've got. Uh, they start off very simple with a type of shell septa that's called uh, goniatitic, which is very smooth. I should have prepared here and actually grabbed a pen. Hang on a second. Sorry. Yes, paper. Drawing time. So these goniatitic suture patterns, let me get this up on here, meant that if you were to split the shell in half, whoops, splitting the shell in half, okay? Goniatitic meant that it was very smooth, maybe a little bit of a wiggle in here. There we go, kind of a nice little wiggle. So this is, this is like midline on the shell, and we're going towards the head of the animal is towards the bottom. So that's goniatitic. It's a very, very smooth septa that's dividing the living chamber from the rest of the shell. And these, these ones were around way back in the Devonian, the, the whole, whole 400 million years ago, way back in the, in the Paleozoic. And then they got more complex. They went to something that's called the serotitic shell or suture pattern. And these ones are kind of cool because toy, they had these very smooth, the back end towards the tail, or you know, the, they don't really have a tail. So away from the head, that's called a saddle, something that you sit in. So it's called a saddle. And then the part that comes up to the front, got all wiggly and smooth and wiggly and smooth and wiggly. And so that would be your serotitic. And then we got closer to when the dinosaurs were kicking off in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous, all the way to the end of the Cretaceous, although some of it went back to the Permian. And this is called ammonitic. This is your classic ammonite for when you think, uh, you know, ammonite. And they get weird, totally, totally weird. And they get all branchy coming up. And they get all branchy coming down. And they get all branchy going up and going down. I mean, they just, wiggle all over the place. And these extra wiggles are fantastic for strengthening the shell. So these wiggle lines are very fragile. They can't withstand a lot of pressure. And so it's looking like as ammonites are getting older and older or further closer to us, uh, they're diving deeper and deeper. Ha they have to withstand more and more pressure in the water. And so they used those extra sutures, those fingers, those lock and key sutures to help support themselves. Now, I don't have any of the, the goniatitic shells to show you, but I do have a serotitic one. It's gonna be really hard to see though. Maybe, oh, it actually focused. Hi, biggity. And here is one of those lobes, one, one of the saddles, excuse me, one of the saddles, which is very smooth and round. And then it's going to come up into, see if I can even get closer. Oh, yes. It's got little fingers on the end. So it's starting to branch out a little bit. It's getting a little bit more complex, but those saddles are still really super smooth. So this is a pretty good sized ammonite. This is only a partial shell in here. Now, when we draw ammonites, it's kind of weird in the literature. If you draw an ammonite, you, you draw it like this. So the inside is coming up through here, and then the opening of the shell is way up at the top. That's how you draw an ammonite. But an ammonite lives the other way. So the, the tentacles are coming down at the bottom. The body of the animal is down at the bottom. And the rest of, of these septa, and the rest of these, the planet spiral here, is, is um, filled with water and air, and they can siphon out the water and add and pull air from the water column into their shells to help make them go up. And they can fart bubbles to make them go down. So they just kind of float around in the water column, depending on what food source they're after. They're, some, of them, some types were thought to be closer to the ocean floor going after crabs and, and snails and, and other hard, hard objects. Um, 
some were thought to be in the water column going after fish. And we do know that these creatures were often fed upon by other predators such as mosasaurs, because we will actually find these shells with big chomp marks in them. Uh, I couldn't grab the one shell that we have that has some amazing bite marks on it because it's currently upstairs on display, but next time the Heritage Center opens, come on by, go into our underwater world, and you can actually see the bite marks in an ammonite shell. Okay. Now, we do still have ammonite-like creatures. They're called uh, belemnites, or uh, excuse me, baculites. Too many words, ah, too many words. <laughs> the belemnatella are the, uh, the bullet squid, they're called. Uh, baculites are a straight-shelled squid. So here we have a straight one, here we have a coiled one, and both of these, you can see that beautiful, beautiful ammonitic lock and key pattern. Let's see if I can freeze right here. Beautiful lock and key pattern running through there. So both of these shells have had their mother of pearl, the actual outside cell sh uh, shell structure, sanded off so that you can actually see the lock and key pattern, just because it's really cool looking. And again, here is the inside of the one shell. Some of these get really super pretty. Now remember, only the last chamber in here is where the animal is living. All the rest of these are open. Uh, this one's kind of neat. Let's see if I can get it to focus. I can hide, hide and focus. There we go. Hiding seems to work. You can see all the crystals formed on the inside of these chambers. Each one of these chambers is acting uh, like, like its own little geode. kind of neat in here. Now on this shell, it's kind of hard to see be just based on, on where it was split in half, but they have something called a, a siphuncal. Another fun word, a siphuncal, which is a tube that will connect all of these chambers together. That's how they can add water or add air, you know, subtract water, and they can change the pressures within their shell. And on a nautilus, the creature that's still alive today, the siphuncle is right smack dab in the middle of each of these septa. And on ammonites, it's actually er, way over here on the edge. And it would climb right on the outside edge of the shell, all the way up and around. And let's see if I can... Okay, this is gonna be a little bit weird. I'm gonna have to switch around. So here we have uh, an example of an ammonite on the left side of the screen, or not, excuse me, a nautilus on the left side of the screen. So those are the creatures that are still alive today. And they have a hood, it's kind of a leathery hood that's sitting on top of their, their heads, their soft body here, in order to protect themselves. I'm gonna verify with Clint here. Clint, can you see my mouse moving? Mm -hmm. Yes! Okay, so yes, we have this soft structure here, which is called the hood which they can pull their body into the shell and then close it with the hood. And they don't think that the ammonites had that. Here's my little shell that I showed you again. This is a nautilus off to the side here. And here you can see the siphuncle whoop, right in the middle, smack dab in the middle of that shell to help pressurize the animal. And again, you can see how very smooth, even on the outside edge here, how very smooth that contact is. Nautilus do not have the really, really cool lock and key structure that ammonites do. Just want to show you this beastie. Good size ammonite, right? Pretty good size. Definitely a fun one. I suppose I should hold it in life, excuse me. In life. There we go. Whoa! Now they don't have a hood coming off the, the end in order to protect their faces, but we are finding another kind of fossil that's associated with ammonites, especially um, mass death sites of ammonites. So say there's a, a mudslide underwater or something, or an anoxic event which sucks all the oxygen out of the water or something like that, what, whatever is happening in order to kill a whole bunch of these at the same time. Uh, we'll find lots of these shells. And then we find this extra little weird paired shell. It's called the Eptictus. I'll, I'll add it into the YouTube video, <laughs> the correct spelling anyways. But they think that's actually the beak 
of this animal, the mouth parts. So they would have a beak like a squid does to help chew through tougher objects. Like I said, these things tend to get jumbled up on, on death assemblages. So this is a death assemblage. It's a big sandstone concretion and it has a number of ammonites stuck inside here. So here we have one ammonite in here, nice smooth shell beastie. There's another little section of an ammonite over here. There's also a lot of other stuff in here. Um, focus, focus, maybe not. Uh, there are some little clamshells. There are, oh yeah, there we go on this side. Uh, there's a little clamshell right there. Some little bivalves, things that have uh, two shells. So we have the chambers of a broken open ammonite running through here. But this is, this is something that we would call like a death assemblage, where it's just a whole mass of creatures that have piled in together after they've died. And I had mentioned mother of pearl. A lot of times, well, not a lot of times, but, but sometimes with ammonites, it's kind of neat. They will preserve themselves or the, the shell structure is, is made out of, of calcium carbonate and it will realign into a, a, a aragonite. So yay geology. And the shell will actually stay. It'll change form as far as the chemical composition, but it, it sticks around. And some of that we can find, like here we have a concretion, just a lump of rock, doesn't look like anything from the outside, right? Well, somebody was really smart and hit it with a hammer, whack, and split it open. And here we have a beautiful ammonite hidden on the inside. And if I get really close in here, come on camera, you can do it. I'll just tilt it anyway. So you can kind of see how it's shiny. This one's actually mostly pink even. I wish it would focus but that mother of pearl is still on the outside edge. Now the ammonite itself in this specimen is a steinkern. So that word that we talked about yesterday, meaning that it's a, a mold. So the whole entire inside is gone. There are no septa, there are no sutures, all the rest of the inside of this shell are gone. It's just mud, that's all it is. So the only thing preserved on this animal are the outside, the mother of pearl. So yes, sparkles, lots of sparkles. I think I have, uh, two shakes here. I have too many fossils on my shelf behind me. Oh, here we go. Oh, did I drop it? None of you saw that. Okay. <laughs> here, here we have another, another shell. This is my personal shelf. Don't worry, I don't get in trouble for dropping this one. This one, you can see some reds and greens, maybe some blues and oranges in here. This is covered with a type of mother of pearl when it's, when it's called gem quality mother of pearl. It's called amylite, A-M-M-O-L-I-T-E. So amylite. So they'll actually make this into jewelry. Have a little one there. Just a little fun amylite. Some ammonites are preserved with fool's gold. Well, lots of fossils can be preserved with fool's gold. Here is a pyrite ammonite. So pyrite being fool's gold. Don't focus in here. It doesn't like this one either. Come on, camera. Wish there was like a manual focus on here. It's got an interesting shell structure though. Looks kind of like a tire. Mer, rolling around the Cretaceous seas. And one of the oldest ammonites that we can have here in North Dakota, I, we haven't looked to see exactly what kind of ammonite this is. Uh, the shell shape is looking kind of like Hoplescaphytes, but this is one that we collected out in the field. In a different kind of preservation, these are flat as a pancake in something we call a paper shale. You can see them there, there. It's just in the, in the little protective box in here, but they are flat as a pancake. And we ended up having to sit in the rocks and we just broke them open with our hands with a couple of a flat um, 
trowels, just split open these rocks. And here on the inside were these really, really cool ammonites. And these are from the Niobrara Formation, which are some of the oldest rocks that we can find at the surface in North Dakota. Now, other ammonites that we can get in North Dakota include creatures like, uh, this is another helpless scaphides. And it's got this long section in here, so it's not a perfect circle running through here. It's trying to be one of those heteromorph fossils where it's stretching out and becoming a little bit weird at the end. Um, but it's also kind of neat because it's got these excess little horns and bumps. Some shell decoration running through here. And just because I think it's cool, this is the, the last show and tell piece I'll show you before we open it up to everybody. Uh, this is one that my husband found for me in England. He went over and visited London. And here we have a cool fossil, let's see, focus. You can do it. This camera does not like me, I'm sorry. Uh, but this is a, a cool little fossil that was found in England. And again, found or similar fossils to this, similar ammonites to this would have been found by my personal hero, uh, Mary Anning, who is amazing. And you should all read about her because she's really, really cool. At this point, we're going to open it up to questions again. So I'm sure Clint has a whole list of, of questions because ammonites are awesome. What do we got? Ammonites have bones. Do ammonites have bones? Ammonites are considered invertebrates, so they don't have a backbone and they don't have a skeleton like us. Um, they're mostly soft and squishy, except for the shell and except for their, their chewy mouth parts. We weren't sure if they had hooks on their arms like some squid do. There are some earlier straight-shelled creatures like like our Orthoceras. There are some amazing fossils that I just uh, discovered recently uh, and they have these beautiful beautiful ghosts of where the arms where the soft tissue was but all the soft tissue is gone all you can see are these little little lines of hooks running from these straight shelled ones uh, but we don't know if ammonites themselves the coiled shelled ones we don't know specifically if they had hooks but as far as bones no bones shell yes bones no could you have an ammonite preserved in something like gold or silver? Could we have an ammonite preserved in something like gold or silver? Not so much just based on how, um, how, how those elements form. That's a, a single element. Do you have a question? Um, yes. You could cast them. If you made a copy and you made it out of wax, you could do like a, a lost wax process and you could cast them in gold or silver, which would be really, really cool. But as far as natural cast, not so much. You need something that can dissolve in, in water and slowly trickle through those cell structures in order to, to preserve them. Uh, in the case of the pyrite, the pyrite is actually a steinkern as well, where the whole thing has been replaced with pyrite. There's nothing on the inside. There's no septa, no sutures or anything like that. Um, so you're going to have to have something that's very, very fine, fine in minerals. You can get... Um, Opal fossils, which is really cool. Um, opal like this stuff. So you can get opalized fossils, but I don't think on the gold or silver. How would the predators that wanted to eat ammonites get inside the shells? How would a predator that wants to eat an ammonite get inside the shell? The shell itself is actually very thin. So it's not the best armor in the world. It's not like when you're trying to eat, say like a crab. Well, it's, it's kind of like when you're trying to eat a crab where, where you can still break it with your hands. Um, so the ammonites are gonna be still fairly fragile and with, a, with enough crushing force between a couple of pincher teeth, like crab crackers. So crab crackers essentially like a mosasaur jaw and just kind of crack right through it. Uh, the same thing is going to happen with the mosasaur. There are some mosasaurs that are very much equipped for eating hard-shelled animals called globodens, and they actually had big circle globe-like teeth that are good for crushing those shells, and they would make mincemeat out of ammonites. So combine a couple up here. Mm -hmm. Where were ammonites on the food chain, and what did they eat? 
where were ammonites on the food chain and what did they eat? Uh, ammonites are carnivores. They are predatory. There were some people that thought they would be filter feeders, but uh, the whole rest of the family are, are carnivores. So they're eating other animals. They could be eating fish, they could be eating crabs, they could be eating pretty much anything they could get their little tentacles on. And so small things. Although some ammonites are really big. I know you can't see how tall I am, but my shoulder is sitting at about, what, four-ish feet or so? A little, little more than four feet. Uh, but there are shells that are actually as big as up to my shoulder. So some of these animals could get very, very large. Uh, I don't have any of those for show and tell because I wouldn't be able to lift them. <laughs> <laughs> I could stand next to one, but I couldn't lift it. Have you found any ammonites on your digs? Have we found any ammonites on our digs? Yes, we have. So the, the one that I showed you from Niobrara, this was found on one of our digs. So this, this was found. Uh, Trissa and I were sitting there finding all kinds of these. So we found those. Uh, we haven't done any specific digs for cracking open concretions that house the ammonites. So we, we don't have too many others on digs per se. Uh, we have found them solo on research trips though. What is the weirdest or most unusual ammonite? What is the weirdest or most unusual ammonite? Uh, probably definitely, well, for, for me, the heteromorphs are just plain weird. So like our, our little one right here, you get creatures called Didymoceros, which just have crazy shells. And there's, there's a few others. I'm not an ammonite specialist, uh, but there are weird shells made up of interlocking U's and, and weird just things all over the place. So, so definitely one of your heteromorph types of, of ammonites. What would they taste like? What would they taste like? Probably like squid or octopus. So if you like eating calamari or you like eating octopus, probably pretty similar to that. Are you guys they, are making me hungry. <laughs> are they like turtles at all? Are they like turtles at all? No, turtles are, are from a branch uh, called reptiles. So those are shelled, cold-blooded, scaly animals. Um, and, and so your ammonites and your squid and your, your octopus are, are from a group called cephalopods. A little bit different. They're invertebrates, so they don't have a backbone uh, or really much of a skeleton at all. Did they have any defenses besides their shells? Did they have any defenses besides their shells? Probably those ink sacs. So we know that the, the really old straight-shelled ones had ink sacs, and there's no real evidence to believe that the, the, the newer ones didn't have them as well. There are some fantastically preserved specimens that would have space within the shell for where those ink sacs should be. So they probably could escape in a cloud of, of gloom in the water. Were they warm? Are they warm or cold blooded? Are they warm or cold blooded? They would have been cold blooded. Um, a few people tuned in a little bit late, and people are just asking for a refresher of what an ammonite is. I just want to give like yep. what they're really so so brief overview. Yeah. So refresher course. Er, if you say if you logged in late, so an ammonite is related to octopus and squid. My happy little inkbert here. Hello, inkbert. Hello. And so they would have tentacles out of the bottom of their shell, like this, with tentacles. See, inkbird is useful. Hey, floating around the water column. And they are related to, so they're related to squid and octopus. They have a shell on the outside. They're cold-blooded. They're carnivores. Uh, they eat other creatures. They lived at the same time as dinosaurs. They are around a lot earlier than dinosaurs. And, and, now sea monsters. and and now they're dead. Did Megalodon eat ammonites? Ammonites sadly went extinct with the dinosaurs. So with the, the KT boundary about 66 million years ago or so, uh, ammonites, I think they lasted just a little bit longer after the big asteroid impact and everything, but they, they died very, very quickly after. Yeah. So ammonites are all gone with the dinosaurs and with the mosasaurs. Where do you find ammonites? Where do we find ammonites? In the rock. 
<laughs> no, uh, there are different rock layers that you can find them in. You can find them in concretions, uh, the Fox Hills Formation. You can find them in the Niobrara Formation. Um, there are many different rock layers that would house them, but they would have to be a marine environment. So you're not going to find an ammonite, say, in the Hell Creek Formation along with dinosaurs. So they're going to live in the water portion of your rock formation, not the land for, of your, your rock formation. And that would just take more courses on geology. I don't know if we know this one, but why are they called ammonites? Why is it called an ammonite? Thank you, I do know that one. Okay. <laughs> I forgot to go over that one. Ammonites were named after the Egyptian god Ammon, so A-M-M-O-N, or A-M-U-N, who is a very high-ranking Egyptian deity who had ram's horns on all of the coins that are displayed with them, on any of the, the, the tomb paintings, any of the, the um, literature, I guess, uh, for lack of a better term, they would have this coiled ram's horn. So am, uh, ammonite means, or is related to Ammon's horn. And the Ceres at the end of a lot of these names, you, you get uh, Orthoceres, uh, Ceres refers to horn. So the Ammon refers to the Egyptian god Ammon, and Ceres is referring, referring to horns. Good question. Why are some shells different than other ones? Why are some shells different than other ones? Part of that just has to do with radiation of critters and how they're living their life. You have some shells that are super smooth and flat. I have this one. This one's called sphenodiscus. And it doesn't look you know, that different from this angle, but if I turn it this way, it's bladed. So it's very, very blade thin on the outside edges very, very flat edged. So this is gonna be able to slice through the water very quickly. So probably a faster moving animal. This one you can also see on this side. I think it's focus. This has got really, really cool suture marks. Come on, you can do it. It does not wanna do it. Nope, sorry. Uh, so you get some that are fast movers. You get some with extra horns and spikes sticking off the side of their shells for defense. You get um, uh, some that are going to be more suited to open water. You have some that are more suited to crawling around on the ocean floor. So some, it, it just really depends on how they're living their life. <clears throat> are they born from eggs like an octopus? Are they born from eggs like an octopus? I have no idea. Um, We've gotten very, very tiny ammonites, so we know that they start off very small. Uh, I would think that they would be born from eggs like an octopus or a squid, but I don't know for sure. I would have to ask a squid scientist on that one. Do we have any dig sites for young paleontologists? Do we have any dig sites for young paleontologists? We have digs available for people who are 10 and up for half days. And we have digs available for 15 and up for full days. We do not have anything available for younger paleontologists uh, below 10, just due to the safety of the people and the safety of the fossils. So we're trying to keep everybody safe and we just have to have a cutoff at some point. And that's our cutoff. How many species of ammonite are there? How many species of ammonite are there? I'm not an ammonite specialist. I think they said there were somewhere around 38 genera of ammonites or so. I don't know. I'm just pulling a number out of the air. Um, I would have to ask, ask an ammonite scientist. Oh, most of our questions related to ammonites. Well, I see what's the biggest ammonite. Uh, I don't know what the biggest one is, but the biggest shell that I stood next to was, was up to my shoulder. I don't know the name of it, though. Uh, I'll see if I can find it, and I'll, I'll add it below. So I think that wraps us up for ammonites. Yeah, it looks like, unless anybody has any last-minute questions about ammonites or other things, I think that's pretty much ending the ammonite discussion. Okay. Review our it says, how do they get their shells? Are they born to start creating it, or do they just go and find more shells that fits their needs? Good question. So creatures like hermit crabs steal other shells. The hermit, hermit crab doesn't have a shell of its own, so it goes and it finds a shell that'll fit perfectly. 
and, and so it will abandon an old shell and crawl into and claim a new shell. Ammonites are born with their little starter node of a shell, because we've got little teeny tiny ammonites, and they secrete their shell. They, they actually basically, and it's like, it's like how your tongue secretes spit. You, you have salivary glands in, in your mouth and you blah, you're producing all kinds of spit in there. <laughs> yeah, everybody's going blah now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it's the same thing how it's just kind of oozing out of the animal and the ammonite would be also oozing out that shell and just growing it around itself. So adding on to the pre-existing shell. So it just makes it bigger and bigger and bigger. It doesn't get a new one. It's the same one that just grows. Uh, yes, Monday we are starting off with saber tooth cats. Clint will be doing a presentation on saber tooth cats come Monday, so you, you you get a break from my face and you get to deal with Clint's face. So everybody who has a cat at home, bring your cat, set right in front of the computer. It's going to want to see this. <laughs> yes, bring all your cats. <laughs> Uh, let's see, we, yep, we're going to be adding this one up on YouTube. I'll splice it again, do the same thing. Uh, did they live in lakes? No, ammonites only lived in uh, oceans and seas, but they were cosmopolitan, meaning that they were spread worldwide. Okay. So we also have a Discord group. Again, if you logged in late or you think of a question that you want asked but didn't have a chance to ask on air, you can log on to Discord. We have that link up on we have that link up on, on Facebook and Twitter as well. Uh, so you should be able to get that. Until then. The last uh, last question last, that keeps popping oh. up that I forgot. How do they move without bones? How do they move without bones? I'll just stick this in you know, for four questions. So how did an ammonite move without bones? So they would have moved by water propulsion. My handy dandy Inkbert here has the correct feature. So here we have Inkbert. And on the back of Inkbert, we have this little extra tube. And this would be for jet propulsion using water so that they would pull water in and they would squeeze the water out. I need like a squirt gun to like spray you all with water. Whoa, water. Uh, and they would push that, <laughs> they would push that water out, whoop, pushing them through the water column. And so they're actually moving this way. If, if this is the shell, they're moving this way through the water. But if they're hunting, they can slowly creep up on you. And they would have potentially like their little tentacles in here and everything is all nice and close together. And if they see something, if they just slowly move this out and then all of a sudden tentacles, then pull you back in and eat you if they had tentacles. Maybe they only had arms. I don't know. It's the bad thing about no soft tissue preservation. Yeah, if people have more questions, they can post them in the Discord mm -hmm. and they can post questions in preparation for Mondays. Sabertooth cat. Yes, if you have any questions about Sabertooth cats, feel free to post in Discord or on Facebook or on Twitter, um, and we can compile some of those to preemptively answer some questions. So, okay, we're running out of time. See you all on Monday. Thank you all for tuning in and keep sciencing. We'll be back on Monday at 10 o'clock Central Time. Talk to you later. <laughs>